17, if you would. And we'll be looking at uh, the middle of the chapter here shortly. Give you a location after that to exactly what verse. We uh, just finished a series of studies on the Beatitudes. Talked about a lot of things that really deal with what's inside your heart. And if you get that arranged properly, it will be a blessing to you. Thus, blessed are poor in spirit, the meek, etc., etc. And the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Now we look to a new sector of the Bible. Still in the New Testament. Now we're after the time of Christ and his death and his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. And now we're following along with the church, which has begun in Acts chapter 2. Discussion of that. And, and as you move through the book of Acts, eventually you come to Paul's conversion, who was Saul originally. And then he starts this missionary journey. He was passionate in trying to destroy Christianity. And then when he is called by God, he becomes just as passionate or even more so in his pursuit to make sure churches are planted. And so Paul is all over the place in all these different locations. And in Acts chapter 17, he is in an area that's quite prosperous, an area of people that are well, well educated. These are the the philosophers and the teachers of their time that are in this area. And so he comes to this place called Athens, Athens, Greece. And, and as he's there, in verse 16, it says that Paul is waiting for some people in Athens. And while he does it, his spirit is provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. As you go along, you'll see that these idols are not only everywhere within the city and on every street corner, you could say, but they're for a variety of different gods. They want to cover all the bases. Their concept of God is, is so foreign to our thinking, I think it's kind of hard for us to even comprehend it. The greatest vision I ever had of being close to this was making a mission trip some years ago with Chris Willis and Carrie, my wife Melanie. We went to India, and literally, on every street corner, and oftentimes in between, there was some kind of little altar, or large, to some god. It was incredible. And now I read that passage, and it talks about the city was overcome by idols. I have a vision of what that means. If you walk out here, you can see an idol, and you go halfway down another one, and in little shrines or big temples, whatever it was. Now, their fear, kind of like in India, was they were making sure that they didn't get any of the gods angry. They thought they were gods of the sun and the moon and the stars and the land and anything that existed there. There hadn't been a god that brought it about unless there's a god of that. And you don't want any of these gods angry with you. You want life to run smooth, you see. And so if you wake up someday and you're feeling ill, you're thinking, what God did I get mad? And this is how their life was. Just to cover all the bases and make sure they didn't make any mistakes, quite possibly there's a God that they never met or never knew about. We don't want to get him angry either. And so they had one to an unknown God. It was a God they didn't know about, but boy, he could be important, so let's make sure we, we worship him too. And I don't know how they really covered it, you know, but you maybe just go around and burn little sacrifices to different ones at various times. And the more prominent ones you, you double up on because they're the big ones that are important for you. And so you want life to go smooth. You want your crops to come in. You want the rain to come at the right time. You want your family to do good. You want the kids to behave, the parents to behave, whatever it is. And so you have your gods. And so Paul's looking at this. And I can't imagine how things were going with him. But this idea of one God was really different to them. And, and so Paul wants to go about it the right way to talk about the God they don't know. And so in verse 22, 
when Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, this is some big area that people sit around and just philosophize. He said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Well, that's a foreign principle. Irreligious would be more like the thing. But Paul is trying to get their attention. And he does a good job at it. He said, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found even an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. And then he starts to talk about it. They want to make sure they cover all the gods because this might be able to help. But they had no idea about the God that Paul's about to talk about. But they're wanting to make sure they're covering, so they do that. And Paul starts talking about this unknown God. Now, here's the question. Do you really know God? Now, we think we got it together. Because we know the, the one God. We've studied it. We've, perhaps you've read this maybe more than I have. And you understand what's going on here. But I'll still ask the question. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets a woman who is from Samaria. And when he begins talking to her, she catches on real quick. This guy knows a lot of things and he knew things about her that no one else knew. As Jesus is relating that. So she immediately begins to talk about worship. You Jews worship over here, us Samaritans over here. And Jesus says, you worship what you don't know, we worship what we do know. But the time is coming, and now is, that we will worship God in spirit and in truth. And, and all that was kind of foreign to her. And so, are we worshiping, I'll throw this out, correctly? But really what I want to address is the principle about God. Because if, if we don't have a good concept of who God is, then our worship's a little bit off track. Would you not think that's right? So what do you know about God? What do you know about Jesus? Here, let's ask it this way. Do you think you know more than the apostles? Well, no. Because they lived with him, they stayed with him, they, they watched him, they heard him. Of course not. Because everything that I know is from what I read in the New Testament or what I hear people preaching as they're talking about what the Bible says. And so in the Old Testament as far as God is concerned. So I'll get my proper knowledge about God from the right source and from individuals who use that right source. And so my hearing and my reading comes from that. Would I know as much as the apostles? And I doubt it. So let's take a look at what the apostles knew for just a moment. Because if you're following along and you're, you're kind of where I was at when I was looking at this, I, I, I'll admit I don't think I know as much as the apostles. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 8 for just a moment. As um, Jesus is with the apostles, we'll start at about verse 23. They get into a boat with him. And Matthew writes in verse 24, And suddenly a great tempest, that's a huge storm, hurricane measures possibly, and arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he, that is Jesus, was asleep. But then the disciples came to him and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Quite possibly heard him or read this story. Verse 26, he gets up and rebukes them to start with, why are you, why are you fearful? <laughs> because we're about to die. Oh, you of little faith, Jesus adds. Then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now I want you to notice something here. I've read and read and read and read and and You've probably read it maybe more times than I have, but I've read it maybe a thousand times. This particular phrase, because it's really important to understand about faith. Now, here's the question. 
Do you find it strange that the apostles said, save us, and yet they didn't really know how he was going to go about it? Because after he calms the sea, when you read a little further down there, it says they were amazed that even the winds and the sea obey him. Now go back to the, the comment that they made, because they make, they make the comment, Lord, save us, but they don't know how he's going to do that. Had they known who he really was, they wouldn't have said, Lord, save us. They would have said, Jesus, calm the storm. But they didn't think he could do that, you see. And by what comes after that, that's where I gather my point. Because they were amazed that the winds and the sea obeyed him. So they get this broad-based comment, Lord, save us. They don't know how it's going to happen, but they really don't think he can do all that much. Or they have addressed it. Lord, hey, it's time to get up and calm the sea, like you can always do. Now, after that event, they probably thought, if we're ever in this boat again and with him, we know what to ask. Lord, hey, do your thing again. But they've never been in that situation before. They never allowed themselves to be so, so tied down and so stressed and so whatever. And so here's this thing that the Lord save us. But did they know God? Did they know who Jesus was? I don't think so. Because they were amazed at what he was capable of doing. So I'll ask the question again, do you know God? You say, well, I'm not as good as the apostles. Well, they didn't do too well in their mark. You can go on down through the Gospels and you can see different events. Matthew chapter 17. Luke records it also. Discussion about Jesus going up on a mountain with just three of them now. Peter, James, and John. And as he does, he's transfigured is the way the description is before him. In other words, everything about him changes. He's starting to glow brighter than the sun. That's freaky. I mean, really, if you could imagine it. Such, such a glaring thing. And they really get a touch of a vision because he's talking to two of the greats from the Old Testament, Elijah and Moses, prophets in, in the law. And here's Jesus with them. And so they get the idea, wow, Jesus is as good as them. Let's make three temples. And God speaks out. And you remember the comment? This is my son. Hear him. Better than, in other words, Moses and Elijah. We're getting the idea of what's going on here. These are the three guys that Jesus allowed. He selected them out of the, the twelve, took them up, and they're still amazed, and they still don't know what's going on. Now, I'm headed somewhere with all, <clears throat> excuse me, with all of this. <clears throat> Maybe I'm headed there. <clears throat> Greg, I haven't been close to you. You can't lead singing, and I can't preach. So let me say, we knew that. <clears throat> Why is he up there anyway? So, as I go back to that passage in Acts 17 about that unknown God, and he says, I'm, let me tell you about this God you're worshiping that you don't know. In verse 24, he says, God who made the world and everything in it. Since he's Lord of heaven and earth. Had they really realized how much control and how much power and the divine nature that was in Jesus, they had a better angle on all the way through. Sometimes when I'm talking about being a Christian or being a disciple that is following Jesus. And, and I, I really think that at the very beginning, they didn't know, not only know who he was, I think they had moments of doubt, like any one of us. Okay, I chose to do this, but am I doing the right thing? Those of you that have made some major decision, uh, bought a brand new car, and it doesn't start the next day. Did I do the right thing? You know, you know it's, all these hesitance on these major things. And surely, as a human being, they had some doubts. 
But all along the way, they kept with him, and the doubts were eventually just kind of wiped away because they kept seeing him do more, accomplish more, say more than they ever could have imagined. And so here's what's happening, and this is where we're at as Christians. The more time we spend with God, the more we're going to know that He can take care of things. And all of these things that these broad-based words save us comes down to we can think about very particular things that He could do. Now, quickly, we'll start imagining that He's going to cure my cancer and fix my debt and all these other things, and He doesn't do all those things. And so we're not sure how much God can do, but that we're not, don't limit God because you're going the wrong direction. Because if you really know Him, you'll trust His guidance, His providence, and the fact that He can overcome all of these things in one way or another in a form you never expected it. There's an extremely interesting story back in the Old Testament in 2 Kings, chapters 6 and 7. And I'll just cover it real quick before you hear. The Syrian army, this great, powerful nation, huge army of men come down and they besiege Samaria. Samaria's walled in city. Not that big, not that powerful, and the army's just camped out. You open the gate, they're coming in, so you keep it closed. You keep it closed, and the food doesn't come in, though, you know, because it's out there in the farmlands. Eventually, they run out of food. Now, they may have had a type of well where they can get water inside, but that doesn't help when you're out of food. How many have ever gone three days without eating something? None of us. So the situation gets down to when you turn to 2 Kings, the latter part of chapter 6, that they are selling doves dropping for silver. Those that have the silver are by that which comes out of the dove after the dove is eaten. Not very tasty. That's how desperate they were to have something to eat. Right outside the gates is the army. And everybody inside is thinking, we're doomed. And along comes a prophet and says, tomorrow, in this area, wheat will be sold for thus and such a price. And they're thinking, where do you get wheat? You open the doors, the army's coming in. But you read chapter 7. And you look at what happens. And although everybody inside thinks it's impossible, as a matter of fact, one servant even said to the prophet, this is not possible. And the prophet said, oh, yeah, it is. And you're going to see it, but you're not going to taste it. And so during the night, while they're camped in, God causes this terrible noise to, to come out of nowhere. And all the vast army that's outside thinks, ah, oh, they've hired the whatever to come down and attack us. And they get up in the middle of the night and they start fighting with one another and they're running out and they're all getting out. And anybody that fights with one another dies right there and the rest of them get escaped. And so everything's gone. Now, another little thing is that right outside of the city gates, just right there, are these lepers. And they're sweating it out because they can't go inside. And if they go any further out, they're in the camp of the Assyrians. And they're thinking, what are we going to do? If we sit here, we're going to die. Let's just go down to the Assyrians. Maybe they'll make us slaves and we can survive. Something will happen. Maybe. If they kill us, we're going to die here. We'll die there. Same thing. Matter of fact, it'll be a little quicker. So the next day, they go down to the Syrian camp, not knowing what God has done the night before. And they get down there, and everything's in place. All the food, all the silver, greatest clothing, but the soldiers are gone. And they're looking around, thinking, this is incredible. Eventually, they go back and tell the rest of the people. So they open the gates up, and a couple of people go out to check it out, and sure enough, it's true. And then what do you have? 
a mass exodus of people wanting to run out the gates to go get food because they've been starving. Now that one servant the prophet had talked about was there at the gate. He saw the food and got trampled by the people and died. Now all of this is to come about to think, how can God fix things? Because, because we, we've got him limited. We put him in this box and say, okay, God, we trust you. We, but God doesn't need to be in a box. Our mind sometimes encloses what God is capable of doing. And so we don't trust his guidance, his providence, or what he's able to do in incredible ways that we haven't imagined. <clears throat> We're just crying out like the apostles in the boat, do something. But we don't really imagine that he can do it. Oh, all of that. So it comes down to, I guess, tied in with the song we sang earlier here, um, just the passage, rather, we read from Scripture about Joshua 1. And we've got to realize that <clears throat> when God says, I will be with you, speaking to Joshua, as I was with Moses, that God has never left us. He takes care of us. He will take care of everything, no matter what your situation is. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the God that we need to know. <clears throat> now, again, what is important for us is to do like the disciples and spend more time with Him. Because the more time we spend with Him, the better we know Him. The closer we get, the more to the realization of what God is capable of doing in taking care of us, even in the worst of times. He not only can do it, He is right there and is doing it. You just don't see it all. And you don't see the whole plan. Like that servant. Can't imagine anything changing. God already had the plan worked out. And God does those things. So the point here is get to know that God. And get closer to Him. Spend a lot more time with Him. Open your hearts and allow Him to take charge of what's going on. In every way. And again, going back to the Beatitudes, you will be blessed. So where are you in your following and knowing God? And is it a situation possibly that is because you have gone without Him a whole lot? You get up in the mornings, you go through your activities, whatever, there are good things. But God's somewhere in the background. Maybe you pause along the way and you say, Lord, thank you for the food and about to eat. We're Head out to work. And the next time you think about him, it's maybe before you're going to bed or, or maybe when you're having supper. And you, you do a quick prayer. It's somewhere along the way, and, that, and that's it. That's not enough to even get you close to knowing God. And certainly, if you're caught up in sin, you don't know God. Because God wouldn't have you doing those things. And he's not walking with you at those points. So if your life is just totally without God, it's time to change. Time to repent. Time to come to him. If he's just somewhere out there on the perimeter, I'd go home and talk to him. Very sincerely before I even had lunch. And said, I need a rearrangement, God. Maybe your family needs a rearrangement, man. And it's time to, to do a thing differently. And you need to take charge of men and say, this is what we ought to be doing regularly. Because we don't know God as a family like we ought to be. And maybe there's a few here that have never committed to it. You might know about him, but there's a difference between knowing about him and belonging to him. 
It's easy to sit on the perimeters and watch what's going on. But to be involved, that's a different thing. There's a commitment involved. It's a baptism into Christ. I'm going to take you on. I'm going to let you be in charge. And maybe some of you, a couple of you, or I don't know, but never have done that. And you're wondering why I don't get anything going in life. It's because you have not given yourself to it. But you'd totally be willing to if you knew it. Like Jesus says to the Samaritan woman at the well. If you knew the gift, and he it is that offers, you'd be asking, and he would give. So we sing a song as we wrap up this sermon about knowing God and how close you are. And I challenge you, and myself included, to think about the time we spend, and if we don't need to be closer. And for some of you, to come down front and get it right possibly be baptized today. If you're ready to make that commitment, we're ready to help you. If you don't know God, come. We stand.